Hi, welcome to my channel Cardiology and Beyond. I'm Dr. Sonali, an interventional cardiologist from India. Today's video is going to be on ejection systolic murmur. Now, before going through this video, I would suggest you to go check out my old video on production of heart murmurs. It is a very essential and crucial video to understand the basis, the fundamentals of murmur production. Let's mind map today's topic. We're again in clinical examination under which we're talking about auscultation and we are going to be talking about a particular systolic murmur called ejection systolic murmur. And under this, I have formulated four questions. Try and answer them yourself. And it's all right even if you don't know the answers because we're going to tackle them anyway subsequently. The first question is, what is an impulse gradient? Now, this is a normal phenomenon which is seen in normal people. It essentially means it is a small pressure gradient which is present between the ventricle and the great artery. So it could either be between the LV and the aorta or between the RV and the pulmonary artery. So let's consider this. If this is a left ventricular pressure tracing, the red tracing, and if this black is the aortic pressure tracing, then you see a small gradient between these two tracings which occurs in the first part of the systole. So this contributes sometimes to innocent murmurs, which is to say that whenever there is an increase in exercise or a larger cardiac output across the aortic valve, this impulse gradient increases. The same can occur across the pulmonary artery. So this is how it is seen. This is the first heart sound. And after a gap, that is, this is the isovolumetric contraction. After that gap, there is a little bit of turbulence which is contributed to by this impulse gradient which afterwards narrows off towards the second heart sound. What are the features of ejection systolic murmurs or ESM for short? Now we've already seen what an impulse gradient is. That is however a physiological phenomenon seen in normal people. An abnormal counterpart of the impulse gradient would essentially be an ejection systolic murmur. So what happens in ESM? There is again peak acceleration of flow in early systole and the impulse gradient and peak systolic pressure is maximal in the first half of ejection. So it is just like impulse gradient but it is much more than that and it is pathological. And in the last third of systole, there is little forward flow. So this is what happens. There is maximal flow, maximal gradient in the early part of systole. And then towards the end, there is less flow. The ESM begins after S1. In fact, it begins after the isovolumic contraction. So this, as I pointed out before, is the isovolumic contraction phase. So there's a little bit of gap between S1 and this ESM. The shape of the ejection systolic murmur is crescendo decrescendo. So this is how it looks like. It's crescendo and decrescendo. It is maximum in the early to mid part of systole. Another name for ESM is also mid systolic murmur. To note that this ESM ends before S2. So here you can see that this has ended before S2. The frequency of ejection systolic murmur is mixed. If you remember my last video on production of murmurs, we know that when there is more flow, there are more low, low frequencies and when there is more gradient, there are more high frequencies. Now when you have an ejection systolic murmur, say for example because of aortic stenosis, there is more flow, obviously the entire cardiac output is passing through that stenosed valve, so the frequencies will be low. And also when the AS becomes very severe, then the gradient becomes higher and then the frequencies would also be more. So there is essentially a mixture of low and high frequencies, so you get an end mix frequency result which contributes to a harsh ejection systolic murmur. Another important point is that the ejection systolic murmur accentuates in intensity after a long diastolic interval. I'll explain this later. So if you look at the overall structure of ESM, this is how it looks like. It is crescendo decrescendo. 
This is in sharp contrast to a holosystolic or a pansystolic murmur which does not begin after a gap. It begins immediately with S1 and extends right up to the second heart sound. And there is no crescendo or decrescendo shape here. To give you some visualization to how this ejection systolic murmur is produced, I'll just show you an echocardiographic clip of one of the most commonest causes of ejection systolic murmur, which is aortic stenosis. So this is a case where this aortic valve is rheumatic, it is thickened, and this is the left ventricle. The left atrium here is hidden, the aorta is opened, this is the right side of uh, the heart chambers. This is the right atrium. This is the right ventricle. That's not important here. What I'm focusing on is this aortic valve. And here you can see that there's a lot of turbulence across this aortic valve. Now, this turbulence is both in systole as well as diastole. The red flow that you see is actually the diastolic flow. So there is some amount of aortic regurgitation also. But when the LV is contracting, there's turbulence in the forward flow, which is to say there is a systolic turbulence which contributes to the ejection systolic murmur. Now when I freeze this frame in systole, this is the turbulence you see. This is the thickened aortic valve and this is the turbulence across the aortic valve in its forward flow during systole and this is the one which contributes to the crescendo decrescendo structure of the ejection systolic murmur. Why does the ESM increase in intensity or loudness after long diastolic intervals? Now this was one of the last points which I mentioned when I was talking about the various features of an ejection systolic murmur. So what causes these long diastolic intervals? Now usually when there are premature ventricular beats, they lead to a compensatory pause or even sometimes when you have atrial fibrillation and when the atrial fibrillation has had a long cycle, that also leads to a long diastolic interval. So let's take an example here. This is, these are a couple of beats of sinus rhythm and here is a premature ventricular beat which has led to a long diastolic interval following which there's another normal sinus beat. So what happens when such a phenomenon occurs in the setting of an aortic stenosis, for example? When a pause occurs, it allows longer diastolic filling time and hence increased volume or increased preload to fill in that ventricle. So that triggers off the frank starling effect and as a result, the contractility of the ventricle for that beat increases. Also, when you have this long pause, the associated diastolic pressure of the aorta, suppose we are talking about the left side, it falls. So post-pause, so after this pause, whatever beat occurs, it faces a relatively less afterload, left, less afterload pressure while contracting. Another reason is that when you have a premature depolarization because of this premature ventricular beat, extra calcium is available within the myocardium which leads to post-extra systolic poten potentiation which is to say that the myocardium contracts with much more vigor. So these three reasons are responsible for increased intensity or loudness after a long diastolic interval. So let's look here. You have a normal sinus beat. You have a little bit of ESM. You have another beat with ESM. Then you have a premature ventricular beat. The murmur is a little muffled. But if you look at the beat after this long diastolic period, this murmur now has become very loud. And these are the three reasons responsible for this. And similarly, as I showed you in the last case, if you put a continuous wave Doppler across the aortic valve, which is stenosed, which was rheumatic in that particular case, and if we look at the pressure tracings which are produced because of this continuous wave Doppler, you'll see here that this patient has atrial fibrillation, and this is a short cycle, and this is a long cycle of the atrial fibrillation. 
So this is the forward flow after a short cycle. This is in response to this particular QRS. And when there's a long cycle, the beat after that, this beat is much longer than this particular previous beat. So this phenomenon of increased in the intensity or loudness of the ESM after long diastolic intervals is seen on echocardiography as well. To clarify a little bit about this continuous wave Doppler tracing of aortic stenosis, this particular patient as we remember had both aortic regurgitation as well as aortic stenosis. So the pressure curves that we're getting above the baseline, these ones, are indicative of aortic regurgitation flow, but we are not concerned with that today. We are concerned with what we get below this baseline and these are the aortic stenotic fl pressure flows. And after this long cycle, we are getting this pressure curve which is longer and rather larger as compared to this particular curve. So if you see the peak velocity of this particular beat, it is 3.7 meters per second as compared to this beat which is 3.3 meters per second. So this is definitely potentiated because of this large diastolic cycle. What are the various causes of ejection systolic murmur? And this is an important overview so that you have a general idea of all of the possible causes of this particular murmur. So there are two types. There's functional murmurs and there's organic murmurs. So amongst functional murmurs, we have those murmurs which arise from the LV outflow tract, those which arise from the RV outflow tract, and those which come from extra cardiac factors. So amongst the ones which are produced from the LV outflow tract, there are certain states which lead to increased flow. So what are the reasons of increased flow which contribute to ESM on the left side? Number one is hyperkinetic states which is one of the most commonest reasons for a short ejection systolic murmur, for example, anemia, thyrotoxicosis, pregnancy, beriberi, all those states. Then there is aortic regurgitation, which we know that whatever blood regurgitates back will go in a forward flow and contribute to a small ejection systolic murmur. Also, when there are instances of severe bradycardia or AV blocks, why does that contribute to an ESM? So as we've already learned about the concept of a long diastolic interval, with bradycardia, when you have a long diastole, there is more filling of the ventricle and obviously Frank Starling's law comes into play. There is extra systolic potentiation because of extra calcium and all these reasons contribute to a small ejection systolic murmur. The second reason for ESM in the LV outflow tract is when there is dilatation of the ascending aorta. So whatever reasons lead to its dilatation, for example, ascending aortic aneurysm, aorto aortitis, and severe hypertension. When there is dilatation, if you again go back to my previous video on production of murmurs, the Reynolds number is indicative of turbulence. When Reynolds number crosses a certain number, for example, 3000, then there's turbulence and turbulence leads to the production of murmurs. Now, this Reynolds number depends on various factors like velocity of blood flow and importantly, diameter. So when the diameter is increased in cases of dilatation and also when the velocity of flow is increased, then it leads to increased Reynolds number and increased turbulence and it produces a short ejection systolic murmur in these conditions. Coming to the right side, conditions of increased flow on the right side again is because of hyperkinetic states as mentioned before and more importantly when you have an atrial septal defect or a ventricular septal defect, there's increased left to right shunting and increased flow contributes to this ejection systolic murmur on the right side or in the pulmonary area. Similarly to uh, on the right side as well, any, any causes which lead to dilatation of pulmonary artery like idiopathic dilatation of pulmonary artery or pulmonary hypertension which is long standing, the same reasons contribute to an ejection systolic murmur. Certain extra cardiac factors like chest deformities like a thin chest, 
or a straight back syndrome or pectus excavatum or kyphoscoliosis all contribute to a louder murmur because of the in change in the anatomical position of the various structures of the heart because of these factors. More importantly, organic murmurs broadly are classified at various levels, both on the left side and on the right side. So all of them are classified at the valva, subvalva, and supravalva level. Obviously, we know that the valva level is one of the more common causes of ejection systolic murmur. But to note, it is important to know the subvalva level on the left side. Uh, for example, a dynamic sub subvalva obstruction like hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, which can also give rise to an ejection systolic murmur. Now that we've learned about ESM and how it sounds like, the question is how does the frequency of aortic stenosis differ from that of mitral regurgitation? So aortic stenosis gives rise to an ESM, but mitral regurgitation does not. It gives rise to a pan-systolic murmur. And the difference between these two conditions is broadly explained in my previous video on production of murmur. So to summarize, high-frequency murmur is produced by mitral regurgitation, a low-frequency diastolic murmur is produced by mitral stenosis and a mixed-frequency murmur, which is harsh, is produced by aortic stenosis, which is what we saw today. So as always, like, share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon and I'll see you again next time with another video.